Good afternoon. We hope all of you are healthy and well. Welcome to our fifth webinar featuring speakers from our postponed client conference. My name is John Schaefer. Our topic today is the leverage loan market, also known as bank loans. Uh, and our presenter today is Sam Miguel of Musenich. Sam is a portfolio manager who leads Musenich and Company's bank loan team. Sam has 19 years of experience uh, in this market. Before I turn this over to Sam, Musenich and Company has been our trusted partner for non-investment grade credit portfolios, including public high, high yield, bank loans, and private middle market debt. Musenich specializes in these markets, and this means our clients have access to a leading specialist credit firm. With this brief introduction, we are pleased to turn this over to Sam McGill. Sam? Thank you, John. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the topic today is the leverage loan market, as John has said, um, also known as syndicated loans or bank loans, um, but essentially all the same product having grown out of the 1980s and 1990s bank lending market, which then through the course of the 2000s uh, became more of an institutional market. Um, I have various segments for you here today. Um, first of all, we will have a recap on leveraged loans, what they are and how the market works. Then there are segments on fundamentals, on the technicals of the market and on valuations followed by a brief outlook at the end. And I hope that we will be able to demonstrate to you why we think this is an attractive asset class for investors in sub-investment grade credit at the moment. So starting with the, uh, the recap on leveraged loans and what they are, um, this is a diversified corporate credit market with an average rating uh, of sub-investment grade, typically B plus or double B minus, um, covering a wide variety of industries. Um, of note on the industry front, there is very little energy in the US leverage loan market, only 3%, uh, which is a distinguishing factor versus its high yield cousin, which is at 12%. Um, and also there's very little financial exposure in the US leverage loan market. And there's no bank capital uh, when you think about it in terms of tier one, tier two, et cetera. On this slide here, you can see our focus is on senior secured leverage loans. 97% of the market is first lien debt, so it's secured over the assets of the business and senior over other claims in the event of bankruptcy, meaning that we get out first when things go wrong. Historically, first lien loans have had low default rates, um, even if there is a subordinated default with long-term average recovery rates of 67% as measured by a Moody study going back many, many years. And you can see here an illustrative capital structure showing equity at the bottom of the structure, hybrid debt and equity instruments, subordinated debt instruments of different kinds, and then right at the top are senior secured leverage loans. So as I already mentioned, you could have a default at the subordinated debt level um, or further down, and there would, could be no impact whatsoever on the senior secured debt, which we lent to. Another key feature of the loan market is on the right hand side here, uh, where it talks about how loans are floating rate instruments, typically referencing three month LIBOR um, in their structures. This means that as LIBOR rises and on the chart LIBOR is represented by the thick grey line, leverage loan returns rise. And similarly, when LIBOR declines, leverage loan returns decline as well. However, there is a key feature of loans, uh, which is LIBOR floors which are present now in almost every loan. They're typically set between naught and, uh, and 100 basis points. And they effectively floor the base rate that you can expect to get paid on your loan. So loans after a certain point become insulated from further rate drops. And this is what is happening right now on the chart on the right hand side where there's a little circle. And you can see that LIBOR has gone below the average value of the floor in, um, and leverage loans, meaning that from here, leverage loan investors' returns are protected by these base rate floors. 
What about the investors and the returns that, uh, that uh, investors get in this market? On the left-hand side here, we have the makeup of the new issue investor base of the leveraged loan market over time. And the most important part of this, uh, of this chart is the dark blue part of the bars, which is the CLO market, collateral, collateralized loan obligation market. Um, this is an ex the, uh, the largest part of the investor base and has really been in growth mode since 2011, when it reopened post the financial crisis, and now makes up about 60% of the investor base. These are closed end structures, which are not forced sellers in any market condition, and they underpin demand with these closed end structures. At the top of the bars in the sky, in the sky blue color, you can see the retail funds, which are also a, a part of the market, an important part of the market, but which fluctuate depending on which way LIBOR is going. And in recent years, they have risen as part of the market and through the 2016-17 period, and then begun to decline again as 2018 and when it moved into 19 and LIBOR rates began to decline. As of now, they're a relatively statistically insignificant part of the market at about 10%, even less depending on your measure. Um, but we can expect to see them come back when rates rise or indeed when retail market um, becomes aware that LIBOR rates are effectively flawed from here. On the right hand side, you can see returns over the, over the years for both the European and the US indices in loans. And you can see that really the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was the only event to have a significant impact on syndicated loan returns um, for a, a year's period. And indeed, in 2010 these were, um, and 2009, these uh, returns were recouped. This year, you can see that we are almost back to flat, and if things carry on as they are, we can expect that the, uh, that the market will be in positive territory by the end of the year. Why is this? There are two main reasons. First of all, um, the market is underpinned by floating rate carry. There's about 40 basis points per month of carry, which the loan market receives. And this means that in periods of moderate volatility, the loan market is somewhat insulated. Secondly, the institutional nature of the, of the investor base also keeps volatility low. Remember on the left hand side there, you've got 60% CLOs. And with that um, closed end investor base, it also insulates the market from volatility. Of course, in moments of extreme volatility, such as we saw in March, correlations tend to converge, and then the loan market will sell off uh, in, in, with other markets as well. But generally, in periods of minor volatility, we can expect the loan market returns to be relatively well insulated. So moving on to the fundamentals of the leveraged loan market as we see them at the moment. This, slides talk about, this slide talks about the new issue market and how um, leverage and interest coverage has developed over time in the new issue market. It's worth noting that this is not uh, a reflection of current portfolios. Given that we're in a recessionary environment, we can expect leverage to be higher in, uh, in current portfolios. This is more about the, um, the opportunity for investors coming into the new issue market at the moment. On the left-hand side here, you can see the, the leverage ratio developed over, how that's developed over time. Um, and of particular interest to us, given that the market is 97% senior secured, is that first lean to EBITDA part of the bars, which is the dark blue part. And you can see that over time, as the cycle matures, leverage does tend to rise. And then as we come through a recessionary period, drops back down again, as it did in 2008, 2009. And it has begun to do so year to date in 2020. So going forwards in the immediate future, we can expect new issue leverage to be at more moderate levels than it has been over the past few years as the cycle matured, and this should create interesting new issue opportunities for investors. On the right hand side here, we have interest coverage, defined as EBITDA divided by the cash interest which borrowers have to pay. And of course, the key number is that you want this to be payable, so more than one times, but you can see here that on average, interest coverage approaches four times, meaning that debt is very much affordable for the borrowers that are borrowing in the new issue market at the moment. One of the um, effects of declining LIBOR 
as well as diminishing investor returns, of course, is that it, may, it reduces the cash interest burden on companies and so, there, and so um, increases their interest coverage ratios. Moving on to this slide on defaults and recoveries, uh, we can talk about the current uh, recessionary environment and, and where we stand. Um, obviously, the uh, lockdowns which came into place across many economies over the earlier part of this year have had a very significant impact on earnings and corporate earnings. And with Q2 numbers now largely behind us, we, are, we think that we have possibly seen the trough in, Q, in, uh, in corporate earnings. It's worth noting that a lot of those earnings came in better than the very low expectations, um, but nevertheless, there has been a significant impact on corporate earnings. What has this meant for default rates? On the left-hand side here, you can see the dark blue line is the US uh, default rate as measured by S&P, and it's just risen above 4% to approximately 4.5% today. It's worth noting that the long-term average is 4%. So this is not a dramatic increase in default rates. Why have defaults not happened um, in the way that you might expect? Well, largely it is down to the impact that the Fed has had in keeping capital markets open so that borrowers have been able to access the liquidity they need to see them through this difficult period. And we expect that this will continue to be the case and that most borrowers will continue to have access to capital markets as they need it. Therefore, we don't expect the, the default rate to climb massively. There were some predictions that it would get into the mid to high teens. Um, we don't expect that to happen. In fact, we don't expect it really to get above um, the high single digits. Um, and we think the peak will likely come in Q4 2020 or Q1 2021 depending, of course, on the path of the virus and COVID-19 developments more generally. What about recovery rates? Um, recovery rates are what you expect to get back in the event of default. And on the right-hand side here, we, we chart them over time. They go up and down, um, depending on the economic cycle and where we are at that point. It's worth noting that these recovery rates are measured 30 days post-default. So they do not represent longer-term recovery rates. Moody's have done this study, which I mentioned earlier before, which shows that over time, the long term average for recovery rates in the senior secured loan market is 67%. So in the event of default, on average, over the longer term, you can expect to get most of your money back. In recent times, because of where we are in the cycle, that has gone down to about 50%, but we would expect that to come back towards the longer term average over time. Sam, uh, maybe we could uh, pause at this point for a couple of questions. Uh, you just reviewed the uh, default rate on page nine and uh, commented that uh, it appears to be manageable. And you also commented about the lower uh, recovery rates on the right-hand side. Uh, and you expect those to return uh, back to more than normal. Do you have any other further view on uh, how you see this recovery rate uh, over the next six to 12 months? in this market? Yeah, I think the recovery rate will, will fluctuate. There are, um, many, as there are many default situations which result in no impairment at all to the senior secured loans. Um, there is an example out there at the moment of Intelsat, for example, which has gone into a default situation into bankruptcy. And in that situation, the loans are trading north of par at the moment. Um, so there are situations where the loans can be completely unaffected. Uh, there has been some comment in the press in recent years about deterioration in documentation. Um, that may have an impact on some, um, on some issuers in the loan market if it gets to the point where uh, the business has been allowed to be run into the ground before, um, before the default happens. But we expect that to be a very small segment of the market and not to have too great an impact on the long-term average. Um, do we think that the, uh, that the recovery rates will go way back above the long-term average? Probably not this time around, but I could see it, certainly see them returning towards a sort of 60% area over the medium term. Thanks, Sam. And, and a second question. Uh, issuers in your market have the option of also issuing uh, or issuing instead 
in the high yield bond market? Why would an issuer choose to issue in one market versus the other when they have that flexibility? That's a good question. Um, the, the markets are quite similar um, and certainly issuers of a certain size consider both markets. Um, and for big deals, we will see uh, issuers go to bonds and loans at the same time and really see which market is going to give them better terms, better pricing at any given moment. Um, I think loans have an advantage over high yield for private equity um, issuers because private equity issuer timelines are relatively short at say two to three years. And the loan market as a callable product, like the bonds have a call structure, which means that you are locked into that financing for a certain period of time. Loans do not have that. So if you're a private equity related issuer and you think that the credit profile of the issuer is going to improve in, uh, in the relatively short term, you might choose loans over bonds. Conversely, if you're looking for a long-term financing and bonds are cheaper for whatever reason, um, as they are at the moment, then you might look for your long-term financing in the bond market if, that's, is, um, if that is your, your time horizon. So it's a bit of push me pull you and it's a little bit of which was cheaper at one time, but it also depends on the, on the issuer's time horizon and how long they expect to need the debt for. Thank you, Sam. Moving on to the technicals of the, of the leveraged loan market. So the, uh, the supply and the demand picture. Here we have a slide uh, showing new issuance and growth of the US leveraged loan market. And on the left hand side here, you can see that the loan market has grown significantly in the last few years, up to about 1.26 trillion today. That was prior to this crisis about on a par with the high yield market. Um, but the high yield market has had a lot of fallen angels come into it in recent months, uh, which has not happened in the loan market. And so the high, the high yield market has grown by several hundred billion over the, uh, over the course of the last few months, which hasn't happened in loans. But you can really see that the loan market began to return to growth at about the 2011, 2012 period when the CLO market reopened and when deal making returned and private equity began to gather um, new transactions. And on the right hand side here, you can see that global private equity dry powder number, which is the uh, amount of money which dry, private equity has at its disposal to spend on transactions. This is a number from Prequin, which they update annually. And the last reading at the end of 2019 was 1.5 trillion globally. We expect this to be a significant driver of new issue activity over time. And whilst M&A has been disappointing in recent months because of the crisis, we expect that over the medium term, this $1.5 trillion of dry powder will be deployed by private equity and therefore bring us new transactions which we can look at in this market and, uh, and provide us with interesting opportunities for investment. So that's the supply side. What about demand? Here we have the CLO issuance and retail fund flows um, on this slide. On the left hand side, we have annual US CLO activity. And you can see that in normal market conditions, the, we can expect the US CLO market to print north of $100 billion of volume each year. A reminder, these are the closed end structures which hold 60% of, uh, of the market's new issue. So this is a significant driver of demand for loans. In this crisis, that stopped for a few months. And so the revisions to um, expectations for this year came down. Uh, most commentators moved to an expectation of about 40 to $50 billion of CLO issuance this year. However, uh, CLO liabilities have tightened quite dramatically. That's the debt costs of CLOs, which drive the equity arbitrage and therefore allow CLOs to print. And so CLO market has come back in strong form. And people are now revising their expectations for CLO issuance this year to more like the 80 billion range, not far off the 100 billion, which you might expect in a normal year. So CLO issuance is back and is driving demand for loans at the moment. 
On the right hand side, you can see retail fund flows and how it relates to treasury yields. Um, and if you look at the dark blue part of this chart, you can see that uh, retail fund flows increased through 2018 uh, and to a certain extent in 17 as well as rate expectations continue to increase. As rate expectations tailed off towards the end of 2018, you can see that retail fund flows became negative, in some cases quite dramatically negative, um, and so and a lot of retail money flowed out of the loan market, taking the percentage of the loan market down from north of 20% to about the 10% that we saw on the slide earlier on in the presentation. At the same time, high yield flows, which are in, represented by the gray bars here, began to be positive in that period and have really taken off in the last few months as the Fed impact on that market has driven retail towards the high yield market rather than the loan market. Retail fund flows remain negative in the loan market, but they're not a significant driver of, um, of the technicals in the loan market at the moment. As rate expectations normalize and as retail begins to recognize the benefit that the LIBOR floor brings to the loan product, we can expect retail to come back into the loan product, becoming a tailwind for loan prices and loan returns over time. So to summarize on the technical side, um, we think that, uh, that supply will be muted for the moment as M&A begins to pick up, but the demand remains strong from CLOs. And so we expect that they, there will be a slight technical imbalance towards the demand side for the uh, for foreseeable future. Sam, uh, let's pause for uh, one more question at this point. Uh, as investors, insurance companies uh, have the option to invest in the bank loan market directly or CLO debt tranches. How would you compare uh, investing in the two asset classes uh, currently? So um, CLO debt tranches are a slightly different animal. They are really ABS instruments which carry a strict coupon um, and investors can expect to get that coupon and not much more um, in terms of depending on your purchase point um, in the CLO market. So CLOs work very well and their waterfalls are designed to protect debt investors, but the alpha of investing in loans does not accrue to CLO debt investors. It accrues to the equity at the bottom of the structure, which is 10 times levered. Um, so really the difference between our product and, uh, and the CLO debt product is that in our product, you can expect to get that alpha, which we bring to the, to the uh, investment process. And for this year, we are, you know, in our main loan programs, we are uh, 200 basis points plus ahead of the index at the moment. So investors in our product get access to that, whereas in the CLO product, they might not because they're really just getting a coupon and getting repaid as a debt investor. That is really the key difference. Thank you. So moving on to valuations in the leveraged loan market. Here we have two slides on valuations, one from an absolute perspective and one from a relative perspective. This one is from the absolute perspective. On the left-hand side here, we have the, uh, the weighted average bid price of the leveraged loan market in the US as represented by the Credit Suisse Leveraged Loan Index, which is the broad market index. And you can see on this left-hand side that the average price of the index currently sits at 92.33. Um, this is a considerable improvement from the 82.70 at the end of March this year, but importantly, it still offers seven and a half plus points of upside to investors who invest now, because that we can expect almost all of those loans to be repaid at par over time. So there is still upside to be captured in the, uh, in the syndicated loan product from um, index levels at the moment. On the right hand side here you can see the discount margin over a three-year life. This is a slightly technical term but basically it, it equates to the spread to worst which you might see in a bond. Because loans are callable at any time you have to make a maturity assumption. And typically loan investors take a three-year maturity assumption when looking at spreads. Here you can see 
that the current spread of the market is 589 basis points, um, down from 974 basis points at the end of March. And in fact, intra-March, in that uh, central period of March, spreads got out even wider than that into, uh, into the 12 to 1300 range. Where does this 589 leave us today? Um, in normal market conditions, we would expect the spread of the loan market to be somewhere in the 400 to 500 range. So we think that this still offers some upside for investors and is still pricing in some economic stress um, at the moment, uh, despite the retracement from the wides in March. Here we have a slide on, on relative value with the US high yield market, which is previously described as the, as the closest uh, equivalent market to, uh, to the syndicated loan market. On the left hand side here, we have the average price of US loans versus US high yield. Uh, the dark blue line is the same price as from the previous slide, but you can see in gray there, the high yield index where the price has risen because of the Fed intervention in that market to par 70. So there's a considerable price differential between US loans and US high yield at the moment. On the right hand side here, you can see the discount margin that we discussed previously versus the US high yield spread to worst. And you can see that loans are approximately 80 basis points wider on a spread basis than high yield as well. We think this should tighten over time, particularly when you consider that loans benefit from being 97% senior secured. The equivalent number in the high yield market is about 20% senior secured, um, as well as having this de minimis exposure to energy. So we think there is a strong relative value argument for allocating to leverage loans at the moment when compared to US high yield. So those are the various sections on the, on the market. I will now just briefly turn to this outlook slide. Um, there are a lot of words on this slide. I'm not planning to go through every single one of them. Um, in our view, the loan market does offer attractive returns um, at the moment and downside protection, both from the position in the capital structure and from the institutional nature of the investor base, which should keep volatility in check for the, uh, for the US leveraged loan market. In the short term, because of the technical picture which I described, we think the demand for loans will outweigh supply, therefore driving loans higher and, and insulating them from volatility should there be any towards the back end of this year. Longer term, uh, COVID-19 developments are going to be key for all markets and the fundamentals of all markets. Um, but we think that the default rate as it has been so far is manageable and we don't think it's going to spike meaningfully over the medium term. Indeed, towards the end of this year and into next year, we should see the peak in defaults, but remaining very definitely in, in single digit um, percentages for the market. So that's really all I had to say at the moment. Um, are there any, other, any further questions, John? Uh, yes, we'll end with this uh, with this question. Uh, as you indicated, uh, your outlook for the loan market is positive and uh, with attractive returns. Could you please be a little more specific about your expected return expectations for this asset class over, let's say, the next twelve months? Sure. Um, typically, this asset class is uh, is one which delivers mid to high single digit returns. Um, over the longer term. And I would think that over the next 12 months, we could see something like that in the, in the leveraged loan market. Um, as always, it's a little bit of a mix between uh, art and science, a little bit of maths and a little bit of, of finger in the air. But if you take the idea that uh, coupons should stabilize around four and a half percent, say, uh, and then you look at the, uh, the pull to par, the discount to par, which the market currently has, at, approximate price of 92 and a half. Take a three year outlook on that. Um, so divide that by three, add your two and a half percent there to the four and a half percent, and you get to about a 7% um, uh, uh, outlook for returns of the loan market. Of course, you can expect some defaults, particularly given the environment that we're in. Um, so if you imagine that defaults remain where more or less where they are around the 
the 4% area, and then take a quite, what I think is quite a penal recovery rate of 50%, then in the downside scenario, you could, that could be closer to 5%. I think that that is, gives you a reasonable range, but I would probably say that I would put that likely in the six to 8% range. And the reason being that if we go into recovery mode over the course of the next 12 months, then I think that there could be more of the pull to par than just the two and a half points. So my guess would be uh, six to eight percent over the next twelve months, depending, of course, on the on the path of the economic recovery. Okay, thank you, Sam. That was a, an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, if we could uh, go on to the next page, page eighteen, uh, for a preview of our upcoming webinars. Uh, Pre-Halloween on October the 28th, uh, we plan to have Sean O'Connell from Securian Asset Management speak about the commercial mortgage loan market. And then in early December, on Thursday, December 3rd, uh, we plan to feature Gene Preddy from Zazoff Associates, who will talk about the convertible bond market. We look forward to seeing you on those uh, in those webinars and thank you for joining us today. So long.